I wanted to show you guys this spreadsheet I put together a few months ago to diagnose the timing problems I was having with my VGA circuit. Before we look at the actual spreadsheet itself, let's have a quick look at a diagram of the various components involved. This isn't the whole VGA circuit, obviously. It's just the main bits that I was concerned about, the things that most interact with each other and where the timing is most critical. And I also didn't put all of the individual components on here. Um, for example, over here you've got the 74HC590 uh, 8-bit uh, counters. There are actually two of these in the circuit, but they both serve the same function, so there's no need for them both to be in this diagram. This still illustrates kind of the, the data flow and the timing, the timing constraints are all the same either way. So to quickly explain what's in this diagram then, as I said before, you've got the uh, 74HC590 counters over here, um, which provide the video memory address when the video circuit is accessing the video bus. Then there's an array of bus transceivers, which interface the CPU's address and data buses to the video address and data buses. I'm only really interested in the uh, address transceivers here, actually. Now, one subtlety here is that I do actually have two different kinds of transceiver in the circuit at the moment, and this could be one of the reasons why I was experiencing some timing issues, because I have a 4-bit transceiver, which is not um, an AHC part, it's, an, it's just an HC part, and it has worse timing characteristics. So I've made that clear in this diagram that there are two different kinds of transceiver here. That's all feeding into this um, Alliance RAM module, uh, which is currently a 55 nanosecond RAM module, but I've also been comparing against uh, the 71256 uh, 12 or 15, I think it's a 15 nanosecond RAM I have for that one, um, because that's an alternate option I wanted to consider. So I'm going to consider both of those in the spreadsheet. On the other side of that is the uh, the, 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 the D flip-flop, which is used to latch the content of the RAM for the video output stage to keep outputting even though the CPU might be uh, taking over the bus in the meantime. So those are the main components that uh, are involved in this kind of timing circuit. Um, and uh, there's a, I guess there's a set of control lines which, uh, which can be used to turn them on and off at different times. And ultimately what I'm going to be looking to get out of the spreadsheet um, is, some, is some feel for what timing I need on those control lines to keep within the boundaries that are specified in the data sheets for these ICs. And ultimately it's about determining the maximum frequency with which I can actually be reading from the RAM if I'm going to be interleaving CPU writes uh, with, with the reads. So let's go back and look at the spreadsheet now. Um, I'll probably share a link to this in the comments. It's a Google spreadsheet, so it's pretty easy for you guys to pick up and copy and things like that if you want to. Um, this isn't something I've done a lot of, and this is definitely the most complex I could have done this for, um, but it's partly the complexity that made it necessary to go into this detail. So the first thing I wanted to do was make a parts list um, and make sure that I had really good links to the data sheets for these parts. So here you can see the uh, list of parts that were on the previous diagram and the URLs of actual PDF links to their data sheets. And I think that's pretty important. I actually personally also download these and keep them in a folder on my on my disk. I rename them to have the same name as the as the component. But I didn't do that here because I was actually using a different computer. So that's why I put these links in the spreadsheet in the spreadsheet here. And I'm really glad I did. So next, I uh, looked at the data sheets and I tried to pull out the most pertinent numbers from them. Um, I was quite conservative which, with which numbers I used. I wanted to not be putting things right on the edge because I know the circuit basically works, um, but it is probably well, be well, well beyond the specs of the chips. And I'd quite like to work out how far beyond the specs it is. So what I've done here is I've taken a fairly uh, generous temperature um, I can't remember what the exact number was for the temperature. It's, it's the sort of 75 degree numbers rather than the room temperature 25 degree numbers. Um, and I've used the maximums rather than the typicals and things like that, just so that I can be very conservative here with, with what numbers I'm using. So that's what this table at the bottom is. The data sheets are full of all sorts of numbers with weird sort of letter expressions on them and nice diagrams of how the chips should be used. But obviously what's really important here is the context in which I am using the chips. So, for example, if you're looking at something like the the RAM access time, there's a couple of important factors there. Um, so the, the RAM will have a certain amount of time after the address is stable before you should be using the data that's being output from it. Um, but that address becoming stable isn't something I directly uh, control the moment when that becomes stable. That becomes stable a certain amount of time after I turn on a transceiver or something like that. Um, so it's, what's really important to me here is really the transition times for certain 
um, aspects of the circuit, particularly things which are driven by the control signals that I do have direct input over. So what I did was, in my head, I kind of went through all of the times that seemed pertinent to capture. Things like, uh, here we have the time it takes for the uh, transceiver to uh, enable its output. So the time from when I set the output enable on to having the actual transceiver output be stable. And I've put my own acronyms from that for them here um, with a, a kind of a English description of what I mean by that acronym, just because that made more sense to me. It's also helpful where I've used two different parts that might actually use a different uh, sequence of letters to identify the same timing parameter in their data sheets. And you can see that I've, I've also listed which chip I'm talking about here as well, which chip it's relevant for. Sometimes there are multiple lines. Like I said, there are two different transceiver chips I'm using here. So I've got uh, I've got the transceiver output enable one and the transceiver output disable one, uh, which refers to one of the two transceiver chips I'm using. And then I have the same with two after it for the other one. I've also been careful to note what the datasheet actually called the parameter, just so that I can easily check it later on and make sure I got it right. Um, and also so that if I want to try a different part, I can have a pretty good guess as to which parameter I should be looking for in that datasheet. And I also have two value columns on the right hand side here, and that's just because there are kind of two configurations I wanted to analyze. Um, it's cheating a little bit, but one of the value co columns contains the actual parts I'm using. That is the 512k RAM chip that runs at 55 nanoseconds, um, and the transceivers, in particular the slower 4-bit transceiver I'm using, is represented here. And what I've done is I've kind of accumulated the TOD and TOE values um, by using the maximum of the split out TOD and TOE values. So you can see that the TOD and TOE actually match the slow 4-bit transceiver rather than the fast 8-bit transceiver. In the other value column, um, what I've done is I've just assumed I'm going to switch everything to be using the fast transceivers. And I've also uh, used RAM parameters for the 71256 RAM instead. Um, so that's considerably faster than the Alliance 512K RAM. So that table's really handy. I've also marked it up in the Google spreadsheet as being a proper kind of table of data, which means that I can sort it by whatever I want to and um, things like that. It just makes it easier to edit. And then the really tricky bit was this uh, kind of uh, table in the top right side here. Um, well, over here on the left, um, I just put down the clock frequency of the VGA um, and uh, divided one into that to get the time period for one pixel in VGA. Because what I really want to find out here is how many pixels worth of RAM do I have to read in one go? Um, because um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to be reading once every n pixels. I'm going to be reading from RAM. I need to read enough data from RAM that I can then output n pixels before I need to read again. And the lower this number, the better for various reasons. Uh, particularly hardware scrolling is much better if this number is low. And right now I'm using, in 640x480, I'm using 4 pixels here. Um, in 320x240, I was using 2 pixels here. And I think what this table actually shows is that neither of those is actually going to work, and I kind of need to double that up to 8 and 4, respectively. So what's going on in this table in the right then? This one's going to be a bit trickier to explain. Um, I can't just add the numbers up for the various delays involved because, uh, like I said before, the critical thing I need to figure out here is at what points during uh, the sort of wider 4 or 8 pixel cycle of ticks that are coming from my 25.175 MHz oscillator, at what points during that cycle do I want to trigger the various control lines? Um, so you can mentally think of that cycle as being broken up into a series of time slices of equal duration. Um, maybe one pixel duration is the best way to, to look at that, and that's kind of what I did here. There's a, there's a sort of granularity to it, which is basically this figure of just under 40 nanoseconds. And there are obviously a lot of uh, timings which are interdependent. As I mentioned before, the RAM's address uh, timing has to be started at a point where we're confident that whatever is providing that address has finished providing it. So in this table, what I've recorded is the time at which an event is going to occur, and then I have a kind of mnemonic of the event, which is taken from uh, the uh, table to the lower left there that I showed before. These are all the names of the various um, rows in that table. 
Um, so for example, the first one here, I put at time zero, I've got counter output enable, which means that I'm going to activate the output enable line on the, HC, the 74HC590 counters. The duration here is uh, looked up from the other table using um, sort of funky spreadsheet stuff so that whatever event I type in, um, the duration is automatically populated there. Um, then the end time is calculated from the start time and the duration, of course. Next tick is an extra column I stuck on the end, which is basically taking that end time and it's rounding it up to the next multiple of the period. And the period was again just under 40 nanoseconds, um, so this comes out as 40 here, it's, uh, it's rounded to the nearest integer just for display purposes. So what that means is that if something depends on the outputs from those counters, I shouldn't be uh, relying on it until at least this 26 nanoseconds has passed. And if I'm going to trigger an event that depends on those counters, I shouldn't trigger it until 40 nanoseconds has passed. Because anything I trigger, I have to trigger on a clock boundary. So the next clock boundary after the counter output is stable is going to be at 40 nanoseconds. And the next row here is for the RAM output enable. And, and I'm starting that on time zero as well. Um, I'm not going to wait before enabling output enable on the RAM. I'm going to have that turned on at the same time that I turn on output enable on the counters. Um, there's no harm in it. Uh, it will take a while to stabilize the addresses anyway, so the RAM's not really ready at that point, but I might as well have its output enable turned on. Uh, the duration for that is very short anyway, it's only 7 nanoseconds, um, so that one's in there. And then the next line down is for RAM address access. And this one's more interesting because, as I've said a couple of times, the address won't be stable until that 26 nanoseconds has passed, so I need to count the RAA time of 15 nanoseconds from the point at which uh, the counter output enable has finished its work. So the cell in I4 here, which says 26, is actually hooked up to be read from L2, which is the finish time for the counter output enable. And I did these kind of references by hand, they're, they're not automatic, I, I just had to kind of program that into the spreadsheet. So the duration of RAA is 15 nanoseconds. That gets added onto the 26 and we get 41. Notice that that is just over the tick boundary of 40, so next tick has rounded all the way up to 79 now. And then we have the uh, the D flip-flop data setup time, and that has to count from when RAA is complete, which was 41. So now we're going to add 15 nanoseconds onto the 41, and we get 56 nanoseconds, and that still rounds up to 79 as the next tick there. And that is the earliest time at which we should be uh, signalling that the D flip-flop should latch the data. And because that is something that we do use a control line to control, we now have to use the rounded up next tick time uh, as the input for row 6, which is the DFFDH line here. So that's got 79 in it. And that means that on the second clock tick, on the second pixel of the group of however many pixels we manage to squeeze this into, um, the D flip flop uh, can have its uh, latch toggled up so that it, it, so that it latches the data. We've already taken account of the data setup time. Um, DFFDH stands for D flip flop data hold, and this is just timing three nanoseconds worth of data hold time for the D flip flop, during which we shouldn't let the data uh, go awry. Um, it's not really a big deal because it's only three nanoseconds. It's not. It's not that bad. But I've, uh, the the table still fills it out to work out what its end time is and the next tick and so on. On the next line down, I have RAM output hold, um, and this one is. Uh, timed from the uh, D flip flops data hold, and it's actually I've actually input this as a negative number, and this is because the RAM will hold its output for a further three nanoseconds after I stop telling it to output it, uh, which means that the RAM output hold actually leads to a, an earlier end time than its start time, and its end time indicates the last time at which I could tell the RAM to stop outputting without compromising the data that's going to the default plot. So that actually gets us back down to 79 again, which is quite handy, because that's the tick boundary. Now, um, I won't go through all of the remaining details, but I think you get the idea. What I've tried to do is determine and code in 
the constraints on when a particular event can start happening and then the spreadsheet calculates how long that event lasts for um, and then you get this end time and the next tick time and depending on uh, the nature of the individual events, some of them actually need to use the rounded up next tick time uh, whereas some of them can just be tagged on the end of a previous event. I actually put in bold the ones which directly correspond to something which I control through um, through like output enable signals and things like that. So these are the ones which use rounded times. And when we get to the whole bottom of the whole list, you'll see that this actually comes down to uh, TOD at the bottom, which is transceiver output disable, meaning that we're going to turn off the output enable of the transceivers because we're about to turn on the output enable of the counters. I've got this starting at 159, which is uh, clock four. Uh, you can see in the right hand column there. Um, and it has a duration of 11. Uh, so that actually leads us up to needing about five pixels of time for all of these things to complete. But one thing I didn't really capture here is that the uh, output disable can be overlapped with the counter output enable at the start of the next cycle. So that's not actually a problem. Um, we can actually finish all of this stuff with just about within four pixels. And over on the right here, um, I tried to form a kind of a graphical representation of what's happening and when. Uh, the only things I've put in here are the things which are actually correspond to control lines in the circuit. So you have the counter output enable, the RAM output enable and things like that. Some of these um, are doubled up with other other signals. Um, they just go hand in hand. So I didn't put everything on this list. But what I wanted to do was see graphically uh, for different uh, pixel counts along the top uh, which signals are active at different times. So you can see that based on the data, this is all purely calculated from the table on the left, so any changes I make to that table will automatically update the diagram. Um, but you can see that counter output enable needs to be active for the first two pixels of the cycle and then inactive for the rest of them. RAM output enable needs to be active for the first three pixels of the cycle and then it can be inactive. Uh, the D flip flop needs to clock uh, at the start of the second um, pixel and it doesn't really matter how long that stays up for because it's edge triggered. Um, the transceiver output enable is active for the, for the for, for pixels 2 and 3 and then the RAM write pulse happens during pixel 3. And the, the chart carries on to the right uh, beyond that but that's the end of the interesting sort of data here. So this looks pretty good actually in terms of timings because everything fits within four pixels here which is what I wanted in the first place. Uh, but this is based on actually a bit optimistic times. This is using the RAM timings for the 71256 RAM. Um, these things only come in 32k sizes so to get a decent resolution using that RAM you need a lot of chips and I don't really want to go there. Um, so this is kind of looking at a best case scenario. Uh, I think I also made it use the fast transceivers. It's probably using uh, the value column rather than the value two column. Um, so what we could do here now is swap the value two column in for the value column. And let me show you what effect that has on things. So as you can see, the spreadsheet automatically updated that whole table that I just talked you through, uh, which was quite complex of the relationships between the different control signals. Uh, that doesn't need sort of manual attention when I make this change. It automatically calculates uh, how the whole thing fits in now. And you can see that it no longer fits within four uh, pixels. And over here on the right, you can see the effect on the, on the durations of various signals being active uh, that you get from that. So that's all about all I have to say about that at the moment. There's nothing really conclusive here in terms of the timings. That wasn't really my intention here. I just wanted to show you guys what I was doing with the spreadsheet, um, the value of it. Uh, maybe this is something that you'd like to do for your own project at some point. Let me know if you think this is useful um, or if you want any tips on it. I'll try and put a link to the spreadsheet in the, uh, in the, in, in the, in the video description uh, in case anyone wants to actually have a go with it, have a play with it. I'd be interested in any feedback. I'm not really great with constructing these spreadsheets. Uh, to be honest, I can't really be bothered to learn how to do it better. Um, but if there are any obvious tips that I've missed, then do let me know. Um, and I am aware that if I did this in Excel, it would probably be a lot easier. Um, <laughs> I have Excel as well. I just chose to use Google Sheets for this for some reason. Anyway, yeah, let me know what you think and see you next time.